Okay, uh, it's a couple of minutes past the hour, so I think we can get started now. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today's Datadog On episode. Uh, Datadog On is a series where we invite engineers and designers working every day on building Datadog itself uh, to talk to us about a particular technology, a process, or something cool they're building. Um, for me, it's one of my favorite parts of my job being able to, to host this episode because I learn a lot about a huge variety of topics. If you want to watch any of the previous episodes, they're all available on our website, datadoc.datadochq.com. So please go there. This one is recorded as well. Uh, so in about a week, we will be able to publish that one as well. Uh, so a, for, uh, a few of housekeeping items. Uh, we are going to leave enough time at the very end for questions, and we want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have any comments, any questions, uh, if you want to say hi in the chat now uh, to your peers, where you come from, anything that makes this interactive, feel free to do so. If you have any questions for our speakers, uh, you have a Q&A button on your Zoom client. So if you click on that button, you can leave the question there. You don't have to wait until the end. You can leave questions throughout the session. And at the end, uh, we will try to go through as many as possible. Good. Um, so today, the topic today is data visualization, visualization, which is critical in an observability product uh, such as Datadog. Uh, and we are going to cover both design and uh, the technical architecture of those data visualizations at Datadog. So um, to, to just to let everyone know, uh, in case you're not a Datadog user, you haven't heard about Datadog before, uh, Datadog is a monitoring and analytics company uh, that helps uh, companies improve observability of their infra and applications. And because of that, uh, as a monitoring company, visualization of data is, is critical. Uh, so my name uh, is Sara Polito. I'm one of the co-hosts uh, of uh, Data.com series. So if you have any topics that you, you would like us to cover or any feedback, any further questions that you can cover during this session, uh, please do reach out um, and I'll proxy that question to the speakers if that's the case or I answer myself directly if it's a question about Datadogong in general. Uh, but the important people today uh, here is our Kemper and Mark. Kemper, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Ara. I'm Kemper Smith, the team lead of the data visualization design team. Uh, our team works with other product teams and the engineering teams on early stage designs for visualizations across Datadog. Uh, and hi, my name is Mark. I am uh, one, the engineering team lead for the one of the two DataViz engineering teams at Datadog. Um, my team is called DataViz Library, and we build um, a lot of the framework code that other front-end engineers use to embed visualizations in the app, uh, a lot of the code that gets data into the visualizations, um, and a bunch of pieces of our sort of core uh, set of visualizations. Good, thank you. Cool, so data visualization observability. Um, so data visualization is a topic that obviously is becoming more and more important uh, as we live in a very data heavy world. And, but it's also very, very important if we, we see, um, if we are talking about a DevOps environment and particularly in an observability space, uh, because usually when people are using um, an observability product, they're trying, in many cases, trying to debug uh, an issue in production, and they're under stress, so this becomes even more, more important. So uh, Kemper, do you want us to give us an overview? Why do you think data visualization is such a critical thing when we are talking about observability and DevOps? Yes, absolutely. Um, at Datadog, we're like really passionate about data visualization. We, we really spend a lot of time and invest a lot of resources in building really great visualizations because we just think they're critical. Um, and here's some reasons why we think visualization is critical for observability. Um, at a very basic level, uh, visualization can really increase the density and in information you can see at one time. Uh, just seeing numbers in a spreadsheet or um, a list uh, can be a long time to actually gather meaningful information from that. So uh, mapping information, numbers, 
to shapes and colors uh, can really increase the density you can see at one time and you can uh, really quickly see uh, get insights from your data when it's presented in this compact way. So this is an example of our host map where you can see individual hosts. This is roughly about a thousand hosts at run at one time. You can really quickly see that um, uh, there's about two groups that are having you know a high CPU utilization. Uh, the red group's kind of in the center left, uh, and so like this is a great way demonstrating like how when you combine a lot of information in one area, it can be really useful. Another reason uh, visualization is critical is it's really good at showing patterns. Humans are really good at showing, uh, at, at visualizing patterns when you can see a lot of information at once. Uh, this is an example of time series graphs that show periodic information. Um, the one on the top is pretty dense, but you can still make out that the the data is fairly periodic and, and you can gather some information from that. And once, and once patterns are established and you kind of have an established pattern, uh, visualization is great at revealing outliers in that pattern. So it's, it's incredibly efficient at showing, um, you know, something that's unexpected that you're not used to. And one other benefit to visualization is it's really good at providing context. Um, oftentimes, visualization is not even the main content. Maybe it's uh, assisting understanding in, in related content on a page. Uh, here, for example, is our profiling comparison page where we're showing um, methods and how much CPU time they're utilizing. And this is comparing two separate profiles that were done at different time periods. And the visualization on the top the time series graph can kind of give you a sense for where those profiles were taken and sampled. Uh, you can kind of see the one on the left was done over a long, much longer period of time than the one on the right. So it can, visualizations can also complement uh, other information on screen to kind of provide a little bit of extra information. Um, and you kind of combine all these benefits of visualization and together they can kind of reveal hidden information um, one really great um, demonstration of that is this uh, data set called the Anscombe's Quartet. It's uh, four data sets that were devised by an uh, English statistic statistician that uh, in the 70s that kind of demonstrated this idea of how you can have four unique data sets, all with very different distributions of data points. Uh, but when you actually look at their summary statistics, the averages between the data sets, uh, and, the and how they're correlated between the X and the Y values, uh, they're all the same. So if you're just looking at simple averages and simple uh, summaries, you're gonna miss this inf the information that the data visualizations can reveal. Each, each data set tells a very different story uh, compared to the, the summary statistics. So yeah, those are always visualization is, is critical to observability. And we invest a lot of time, as I said, in visualization. Uh, and there's, there's details and elements of visualization that we truly spend a lot of time on because we think they're actually absolutely critical and specific to observability. I'm gonna walk through a few of those. First of all, labeling is absolutely important in visualizations. If, if a viz is not labeled, it's pretty much useless. You can't really get, get any meaning from it other than um, some ab abstract patterns that you don't really know what they refer to. Uh, and oftentimes in observability, labels are, are pretty long and hard to understand. So you've got long path names, you've got long resource names, a lot of different uh, labels can be pretty long. So we do our best to show these labels and overlay them, over, overlay them on, on visualizations. But oftentimes we can't, we just can't fit all the meaningful labels. So we make sure we provide interactive tool tips to show and give meaning to the visualizations we provide. So we spend a lot of time on, on labeling. And we also make sure our visualizations are easily filterable and, and navigable. Um, it's, it's rare that you have uh, a single view that's gonna provide all the information you're looking at. It's good to have overviews to see all of your data. For example, here in the host map again, uh, you can see all hosts, but it's it's really important to provide uh, customizability and filterability 
so the user can like zoom in to the area that they're interested in and um, get more meaning get, get more meaning there. And we also make sure to link out to other parts of Datadog. Uh, it's also rare that a visualization is the end of your investigation and, and resolves your issue. Uh, it's oftentimes the very beginning or in the middle of the investigation that you're using visualization. So we provide a lot of context menus and links out to other pages that can that can can um, help you um, troubleshoot issues. So like we we never think of visualizations as the end all. Um, we always want to link out to more important views and more uh, so people can pivot to different information. And we want to keep our visualizations consistent across Datadog. Um, it's really important for users not to have to relearn the interface and how to interact with the visualization each in each new instance. We want to keep them as similar as possible, provide unique functions where, where, it, where it matters, but also try to keep the, the visual and interaction patterns across our visualizations as consistent as possible. Cool, thanks. Um, I, I've been, so it's, it's, it's fun when you said the, the, you spend a lot of time, for example, for uh, improving labeling and tool tips. Uh, I've been at Datadog only like two and a half years, and and I've already seen that those improvements and and when you announce uh, new ways of visualizing those labels and tooltips, it makes such such a difference. So it's it's clear that the the work is is being put there. Um, so yeah, I've been two and a half years at Datadog, but Datadog has been around for for about eleven years now. And obviously that evolution of the different visualization and improvements to the visualizations uh, has happened. Um, at the beginning, uh, the, the most, uh, the, there was the time series. And obviously that visualization is still key uh, part of the product, but uh, we've seen, now we have a lot more. Uh, uh, Datadoc as a product has, has uh, increased the, the number of these visualizations that we have available for our customers. Um, Mark, can you give us an overview why we keep increasing that number and, and why it's not only about time series anymore? Sure, thanks. So yeah, um, as Ara said, we've released a bunch of different uh, visualizations over the years. Generally speaking, these have been motivated because we want to look at the same data in a, in a different way or because looking at the same data uh, visualizing the same data in a different way shows you something that you wouldn't have gotten out of the other visualizations. Um, so to kind of both explain what I mean by that and also give a little tour of the various viz options that we have available in the product, uh, I'm going to kind of walk through a bunch of different visualizations that we've uh, built over the years and talk a little bit about why. So um, to start, we have the basic time series viz. This is kind of the fundamental uh, visualization of Datadog because so much of what we're dealing with is time series data. Um, this is a great way of looking at the progression of a series of values over time, um, identifying weird spikes or outliers or um, strange you know, behavior of a, of a particular uh, series out of your whole cohort uh, very visually. Um, it can also be a great way of knowing, you know, okay, is everything pretty much okay, or is one thing going really haywire, or is the whole system going haywire at the same time? Um, and it's obviously an excellent retrospective diagnostic tool, uh, being able to look back at a particular point in time when you were having problems and quickly scan for visual correlations across a bunch of different graphs is like a big uh, use case within the product. Uh, however, sometimes time series can get a little bit cluttered, especially when you have a very large number of lines or, or bars or areas, as the case may be. Um, and so for that, we introduced a visualization that tries to sort of simplify this view, uh, which we call the heat map. And what the heat map does is it takes that same time series data set that you were looking at before, uh, but it kind of discretizes each, uh, each line, it, it quantizes them into these bins, and then it sort of flattens out all the lines into the view that you see here. Um, and the result is that you have darker squares in places where more series are uh, and lighter squares in places where there's fewer. Uh, and this is a nice way of sort of visually compressing the uh, amount of information that you're looking at. And we like, we like to say sort of flattening the time series out into uh, a more digestible view. Um, now, under the hood, there are still lines going on. And so, uh, you know, in the full screen view, it's possible to highlight over a box and see all of the series which actually pass through that space. 
Um, moving on, there are uh, there are times when you might not want to be visualizing data over time, but you want to be visualizing aggregates of that information. Uh, so for that, you might create a top list. Um, and what the top list is showing is it's that same data set just aggregated over the entire time window. Uh, so in this case, we're you know summing up the values of uh, all of the values that were sampled during that time window into a single aggregate, and then um, sorting the sorting the results by that summarized value. Uh, top list is a great way of just sort of seeing what are the biggest contribute what are the biggest um, values among a cohort. Uh, it's a it's a simple and easy visual comparison tool. Um, but uh, sometimes you also want to be able to know not just the individual values for each element in the group, but also how those values contribute to some total, uh, right? If the contribution of each entity in the data set to an overall total is uh, your cup of tea, then you might want to use a pie chart. Uh, this is a visualization that we only recently added to the product um, after a long time of uh, hesitating about whether we really wanted to cross that Rubicon, uh, but after uh, a lot of uh, customer requests and uh, uh, we are happy to announce that we just uh, we just dropped it into the product. So what the pie chart is good at is it shows uh, the contribution of each individual group to the total, uh, the proportion, the rate, uh, what is it, the uh, angle of each slice represents the um, represents the size of the value, and overall the full pie or donut is the total that you see in the center. Um, now, the pie chart is good when you have a relatively small number of total groups, um, and it's nice when you're only visualizing one dimension, but sometimes you want to see multiple dimensions of data for the same uh, set of groups. So for that, you might want to just look at something like a table. A table is technically a data visualization, although I suppose it's a little bit debatable. Uh, but what you're looking at here is one row per data value, and then you can have uh, as many columns as you want, indicating the uh, you know various numerical dimensions of your data set. Uh, table is a great way of getting a quick overview of what the values are, but it can be tricky to actually compare between the different rows in the table because you're ultimately doing a bunch of numerical comparisons in your head, and the point of data visualization is to make those numerical comparisons visual. Um, let's say you wanted to compare two dimensions uh, in a visual way. A good way of doing that is a scatter plot. And a scatter plot, what you're looking at here is actually the same data set that you saw before in the table. Um, just we've taken the first uh, numeric dimension and plotted that on the x axis, and the second numeric dimension is plotted on the y axis. Uh, and so this is an easy way of getting a quick visual correlation between two numeric dimensions. Um, and you know, it, it roughly maps to the same data set as the table that I showed you before. Uh, another way you might want to compare things is. Uh, is by comparing the difference or the change between those two dimensions. The common case for this is comparing the results of two queries from different points in time to see how the, those query results have changed over that time interval. Uh, and that's what the change widget does. So here you're seeing uh, for each group, the difference between the query at the current point in time versus you know, say an hour or a day ago. Um, and this is a good way of noticing if there's any particular outliers or if one element in the group is changing in a way that's inconsistent with the way that the others are doing. Um, so that's my, that's my grand tour of various data visualizations uh, to talk about how those visualizations are uh, designed and added to the product. I'll hand back over to Kemper. Yes, thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks, Kemper, for this intro to why uh, uh, data visualization is important in observability. And thanks, Mark, for this going through many of the visualization, by the way, not all of them, uh, there are more, but uh, time restrictions, we couldn't go through all of them. Uh, but obviously this is uh, data.doc on. So we are, the goal of this series is to learn how we're doing things at data.doc. So the, the, the experts share how they're working on a daily basis. Uh, so I guess the first step when we, uh, when we think or we, we decide uh, that the we need to, to have a new visualization that the dog is, is actually making that decision. Uh, how we decide as a team uh, that we are adding a new visualization to, to that dog Kemper. Yeah, so I, you know, we thought it'd be cool to talk a little bit about our process and um, there's a variety of ways new visualizations can uh, be worked on at Datadog. It's not really one, there's no really one point where visualization projects come from. Uh, we kind of have a, a mixture of 
three main areas where a new new project can can originate. The biggest one being like product specific teams. New products being developed um, require new visualizations. Our existing visualizations don't really support a uh, new product. Um, in some cases, uh, oftentimes a, a visualization can be used that we already have, but it needs some additional modifications or some improvements that uh, that make it meaningful for those those products. So, like uh, real user monitoring and application performance monitoring, all have like unique needs, and uh, we're constantly improving and coming up with new visualizations to support those use cases. Uh, and uh, projects can also come from uh, the, our team, the product design team for DataViz and the engineering teams. We're both constantly evaluating our visualizations, uh, getting customer feedback and doing user research to see where we're wh where we can improve and what new visits, what new visualizations we can offer. Um, so both uh, our uh, Mark and our team can also be um, kind of the origin of new projects. Uh, an example of a project that came out of um, another product team uh, was the, the APM service map and the new flow layout on the right. Uh, so we offered a, uh, a service map uh, for visualizing services and how they're connected with requests, uh, the requests between services. Um, but the a application performance monitoring team had a new capability to actually query all the traces between services and get a and filter it down to a subset of traces uh, to kind of like zoom in and, and filter uh, the map. Uh, we didn't want to offer just like one particular view for that. We thought it was really it'd be really meaningful to show directionality in these filtered views. Uh, and that's one thing that our existing service map was not great at. It was more of a network style graph where things were laid out in clusters. And on the right hand side, once you can filter down uh, your services and your traces, uh, this this view kind of offers a much more meaningful way to visualize how different services are uh, sending requests to other services. So this is a, a project that originated out of the, from AP, APM team's new capabilities. Another example of that is the funnel visualization we have. Uh, the real user monitoring team um, saw a need for actually showing how um, users progress uh, when using our customers' apps. Uh, we didn't really have a great visualization to show this progression. Uh, so the funnel viz is an, a great example of a, a new visualization that came out of just need from other teams. Um, this, this, this can show not just page views across a user session, but can also show actions and different actions perform and show the drop off rate between those page views and actions. So it's, it's a really great simple visualization to convey that progress over time for user sessions. And much more on the pragmatic side, um, we, we take in user requests. Um, the, as Mark mentioned, we didn't really have a visualization that was great at showing parts of a whole. So we built the pie chart and took the user request for a pie chart and, and really took it and it really th thought of a, how, we, how could we add more, more than just a simple pie chart. So on the right hand side, we have a mode for the pie chart that can turn it into what's called a sunburst chart, where you can group your data by multiple levels and see like the nested values within top level groups. Uh, so we kind of took the pie chart and really expanded upon that idea and developing it into a sunburst chart as well, depending on how many group buys you've applied to your data. And so I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into how our design process, once we kind of have a project that we know uh, we want to work on. So uh, very early on, we start sketching. It's sketching is amazingly good at visualizing how a certain viz can be in, embedded inside of a product. Uh, most data viz is doesn't exist on its own. It doesn't float in an empty space. It's a part of a product, and it, it's going to have controls that help the user filter it. Uh, it's going to have to exist uh, across different pages potentially. So sketching early on get, helps us give a feel for like how that visualization is going to sit in the product and, and work across different pages as well. So we do a lot of sketching, but it, it sketching can quickly uh, become pretty tedious if you're drawing individual shapes for visualization. As I mentioned, with super dense visualizations, it's not going to be really convenient to draw individual shapes by hand. Uh, so we get into a little bit more mock-up 
uh, we get into a little bit more detail mockups, but also mockups have that similar drawback. Uh, developing options with design software like Figma can get pretty, pretty tedious as well. So uh, mockups are good for certain circumstances, looking at certain options real quickly, uh, but it's not great and flexible enough to, to really understand how a visualization is gonna, gonna interact with uh, a variety of data sets that our customers bring. And so we very quickly, pretty early in the design process, get into prototyping. It's prototyping with code is a great way to kind of show how visualizations can react to um, large data sets, small data sets, and how someone can interact with them and filter them and change them and, um, and get information from them. So we really, we really use prototypes at a pretty early on uh, stage to, to understand um, our, our projects. And we'll walk through a few prototypes we've made in the past and show how useful they can be. The first one is a prototype we built to, to test out how to show, overlay two different distributions to compare them at the same time on one, on one visualization. Uh, this you can see here on the right hand side, we're kind of experimenting with different styles to overlay two different distributions. Kind of a hard, hard problem is to like really understand the shape of two distributions when they're overlapping each other. So we experimented with a variety of ways of, of overlaying and different styles and visuals to test those. And on the left-hand side, you can kind of see uh, we're testing out with a variety of different data, uh, a, a variety of different uh, fake data to kind of test out uh, and really like, you know, like, test the limits of, of the visualization. So we really don't just build one, one mock-up. We have to see it and how it's gonna be used with actual realistic data. We also build prototypes to understand animations and interactions. This is a prototype we built to try, try to understand how we could transition between two different um, graph styles. This is the service map and clicking on an individual service could actually filter it in a different mode to better show directionality. So we built this prototype to understand how we could convey the transition between those two different layout styles of this map. And prototypes are also really great at testing out color options. Um, color is very critical to visualization and we do a lot of testing with different palettes. And this is an example of a prototype we built for the profiling comparison page I showed earlier. Uh, we tested out a, a variety of different uh, palettes, some with more meaning than others, just to kind of get a sense for how different palettes feel with different data sets. And uh, we're not just testing out palettes here, but we're testing out how they extend with different data ranges as well to see how readable they can, they can stay or how unreadable they become with different data sets. So that's a, another great tool for testing out um, color as, as prototypes. And once we develop these prototypes, we kind of bring them all together in a series of documents and we kind of get design consensus amongst all of the stakeholders. Uh, we, we, we have ways of evaluating the designs and we kind of like use these four main ways of, of checking to see if they actually meet our needs. Uh, so first one, the biggest one is, do they satisfy the user requirements for the project? Uh, that's the biggest one. We make sure um, all the biggest needs and features are, are built into the visualization. We also want to keep them consistent. We, building unique visualizations across products can become problematic over time. Um, users may not understand how to use visualizations. So we all want to, always want to keep that in mind as keeping our visualizations consistent, the interactions between them consistent. Um, and we also want to keep them extensible. Uh, building a visualization just for one product, um, we, want to make, we want to make sure it actually can be useful in the future to other products. There's, it's rare that there's one visualization that uh, is, can't be used anywhere else in our product. It's pretty common that people find valuable ways of reusing uh, visualizations. So we want to keep that in mind when deciding on uh, different design options. And we also want to keep them fe uh, feasible and able to be built and performant. Um, if we're designing a visualization that requires a lot of data, uh, but querying for that data is gonna take some time. Maybe we think of different features we could offer and different ways we can render the information that, um, that make it um, more performant. 
So those are the kind of things we use in evaluating the designs for different visualizations. And then finally, we work uh, with the engineering team on implementation. Um, it's we work pretty closely. We don't really just hand it off to the engineers. It's 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 pretty common that we get into the implementation phase of a project and we're still figuring out designs because new new um, new discoveries happen with real customer data. So we were constantly making tweaks with the engineering team and testing out and dogfooding our visualizations to make sure they're performing exactly how we intended them. Oh yeah, um, dog, dog footing is, a, is a, obviously a, a big part. Uh, Datadog uh, is a big Datadog user. So any, any new feature, any tricks uh, is available first to Datadog users to, to give early feedback. So I guess that's um, a, while, uh, a very good way to, to test it out in real world. Cool, uh, thanks Kemper. Um, so thanks for that, uh, driving us through the design process of those pieces. Uh, Mark, uh, now I hand it to you to, to give us a high level overview of how this is implemented. Sure thing. So uh, yeah, I think to talk about the technical architecture of how visualizations are implemented, it helps to talk about what constraints we're operating under. Um, and a, a short clarification, we'll use the term widget and visualization a little bit interchangeably. We throw around the word widget a lot internally to describe the you know, data enriched content that lives in a box in some part of the Datadog page. Uh, so just heads up. Um, yeah, so first off, Datadog is a pretty complex application uh, and there are a lot of product specific out of the box pages. So there are a bunch of other um, engineering teams that are building uh, you know, the various product verticals that, that Datadog offers. Um, and all of those have you know, at least one, usually many multiple different pages that are all pretty data heavy. Um, you're doing a query and you're visualizing that data in a bunch of different ways. And there's usually a lot of sort of um, additional contextual information about individual data points that we show in side panels or in, or in other parts of the view. Um, so, uh, and then we also, on top of that, have user customizable dashboarding and notebooks uh, where our users are actually constructing their, uh, their view of the data uh, themselves. Uh, one of the things that we try to achieve is to have the same data viz components used app wide so that we don't have a world where the user customizable dashboarding is using you know one visualization system and the uh, engineering teams who are building these out of the box pages are using a different visualization system. Uh, this means that we try to make it so that dashboards and non dashboards are both using the same API interface to our visualization components. Uh, and that turns front end engineering teams into internal customers, as it were, of the Viz framework. This is a very intentional decision that we try to do to keep both technical and product consistency across the application, but it also imposes its own kind of pros and cons. Uh, so for that, I will we'll talk about the pros. Um, the nice thing about using the same graph API on dashboards and non dashboards is that new one thing that's cool is new features and viz types are available globally. You know, when we launched the pie chart a few weeks ago, that was immediately available to any engineer that wanted to embed it on a product specific page. Uh, also, we build a bunch of companion features, as I like to call them, that work on all different pages. One of these is the uh, full screen graph, we call it, where you click the little expand icon and you get a kind of big version of the graph that fills your window, uh, the context menu that shows up when you click on something in a graph, the uh, ability to take a graph that you see on some other page and export that to a dashboard. All of those things are built on this common visualization configuration API. Um, because those different components and the various application code are all kind of speaking the same language about how visualizations are configured. Um, the downside of this approach is one new features are available everywhere. <laughs> it means that we have a hard time, you know, if we can't, we can't necessarily ship something and have it limited to only a specific set of the application or a specific thing. It's going to be uh, certain kinds of changes that we make are going to apply to every page in the app. And that can be daunting. It can be challenging from a product design perspective, from a, from a sort of feature design perspective to, 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 uh, to design things that work globally like that. Uh, we also have some somewhat reduced flexibility on non-dashboards pages. There are cases where product uh, specific use cases arise that we want to achieve, but 
we would find a hard time to do it in a general way that that applies to to dashboards and to and to notebooks and to all the other pages as well. Uh, and that means we're a little bit more constrained in terms of what we can do. Um, and sometimes we want to have page specific customization, which means we have some kind of data dog only configuration options for that are used on specific pages. Uh, sometimes that's a property that is available to an engineer to customize, but not to a user. And sometimes that's actually like a, you know, like an interaction callback or some customization code for color palettes or something that is uh, available when you're embedding the component in code, but isn't available to a user to customize on the dashboard. So um, talking about how we build this, uh, a big part of this system is the widget definitions. Uh, and widget definitions are a, a JSON serializable configuration object that defines all of the user configurable information that's visible in the visualization. So this is the stuff that is saved in the dashboards and notebooks API. When you, you, know, when you save a dashboard, this is the thing that you're saving, or you're saving a bunch of these basically. Uh, it's what you edit when you open the graph editor and you're um, manipulating things in this UI form. You're basically manipulating properties of this underlying widget definition uh, structure. It's the configuration that's used in code for those page specific components. So if somebody is showing a time series visualization on their page in the application, they would be providing like a, you know, a JSON configuration object to that uh, to React component. And that then configures what shows up on that page. And it's also used by features like copy paste, the full screen view, uh, the ability to export to dashboards. When you do that, this is the widget definition is the thing that you're exporting. Uh, another interesting thing about the widget definition is that the query definitions are a subset of it. So that means the uh, description of the data that you want to visualize in the graph is a kind of part of this widget definition. Uh, and that can end up being a pretty complex feature and it's a pretty large API surface area to cover. Um, so on that note, talking about the data flow architecture of visualization components, uh, roughly we start out with a query definition, which is again a description of what kind of data we want to visualize in the graph. We evaluate those queries. There's a variety of different data about API endpoints that we use to evaluate, evaluate uh, queries. We get back a result that you know, the format of which depends on which API we use to query for that data. Uh, and we package that result up into a data structure. We have a few different reusable data structures that, um, you know, they're designed to store the results of a query uh, in the runtime of the browser tab very efficiently. They're optimized for the kinds of operations that we're trying to do on that data and the kinds of visualizations that we're using them for. Um, they don't always exactly match the API response that we get back because sometimes we want to take multiple different kinds of source data and map them to similar visualizations. And so there's a process of translation involved there. Um, we take that data structure and then we visualize it. And each visualization expects a specific kind of data that it handles. Uh, and the visualization renderers handle not just drawing the data to the screen, but also uh, providing interactions on top of that data. Um, so at a high level, the data flow kind of looks like this where you have various different data sources that get mapped to these different formats and then those formats are visualized by um, one or more different kinds of visualization so um, talking about the actual visualization renderers uh, the way that we implement those is first off they're react components uh, the, all of datadog the, the datadog web application is all a react application that's our main framework and it's you know arguably our most critical dependency in the, in the front end so our viz components are also React components. But usually, we implement them with non-React internals. We're not always doing a React render all the way down to the, to the leaf nodes. There's often a moment where it's like you're rendering a React component to a certain point, and then you maybe create a canvas. And then from there on, the call stack is all draw calls to the canvas API or something. Um, there are a couple of places where we draw things with V3, but we've gradually removed those over time. Um, so that handoff to anybody who's ever done that in a web app is still a little bit of an interesting uh, you know, API bond. We usually have a two-layer architecture. We have an outer uh, React component that takes the graph definition and a bunch of configuration properties. And then we have an inner kind of renderer component that doesn't know about the graph definition API, but just handles rendering and interactions, and is usually a more kind of uh, generalized, if you will, visualization component. Um, 
We also uh, talking a little bit about some of the internal details of that rendering stack. So we usually are drawing with Canvas, like I said, uh, that's primarily for performance reasons. We find it has a better performance profile than um, SVG. The other times that we uh, we have some visualizations that are drawing with uh, DOM and SVG using React kind of rendering system. Um, we usually only do that in cases where we're able to virtualize the rendering, that is not draw all of the things on the screen at the same time. Um, and we use D3 internally for helper functions. It's a super useful library of a bunch of utilities that are great for data visualizations, and it's kind of an industry standard in the data viz world. Uh, and then we also have like a big library of common utility code that we've written over time for things like number formatting, color palette, handling, um, interacting with query definitions, stuff like that. Um, talking about data interactions, I just think this is an interesting detail. This gets back to the way that we implement, um, you know, hover and contextual highlights on data points. It's how we implement things like the context menu where you click on a data point and you get some metadata that creates a, you know, that we use to create links to other parts of the product. Uh, each visualization renderer implements callbacks for events like click or hover or highlight or drag. Uh, those callbacks get a more or less standardized metadata payload that tells us about both the visualization and what thing in the viz that you clicked on. Uh, and these are used by, like I said, all sorts of different uh, cross highlight and, and, con and contextual interactions that we support across different viz. So that's my uh, tour of how data viz are implemented internally. Happen to ask, answer any questions later on at the end. Cool, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, I have to say that I, I, as a user, I love the, the widget definition and that it's the same across the board, uh, no matter where you are. Um, to put an example of, of where you can see if, if the people watching want to see uh, these files, um, any, any of our integrations usually have a default dashboard and those are open source. So if you go to GitHub, you can see an actual JSON with all the dashboards, and you can use that as a as a base for your own uh, dashboard if you want to. Uh, cool. So uh, now that we've seen design and and the technical architecture, just to finish with a kind of a practical, fine, um, fun um, section, we are going to talk about a couple of of tips. Uh, Kemper and Mark want to share. Some of the things they use visualization all the all the time. So maybe some tips if you're a data user that you didn't know that you could do with with our base. Yeah, we just want to highlight a few fun tips. Um, this one's really simple. Uh, on any time series graph inside dashboards, you have the ability to uh, zoom in to specific areas by just dragging across the time series widget. Uh, you can zoom in to peaks. Uh, to get more granular data, it's a fast way uh, to change kind of like the time range you're looking at uh, to really zoom in. Uh, also, you can drag the X axis to pan across different time ranges. And all these, all these changes to one widget impact all the other uh, visualizations on a dashboard. So it's, you're, you're kind of modifying each visualization at the same time. It's a really convenient way of panning across different time ranges. I thought that was a useful one to show. Another fun tip is the difference between uh, multi, multiple requests and multiple queries in time series configuration and how that relates to the stacked graphs. So these are that's both bar charts and area charts are both uh, stacked up. Uh, the difference between a request and a query is something that's kind of a, uh, it's, those are the internal names for what these things are. <laughs> um, and it kind of leaks into the, uh, the API definition. If you look at the, look at the detailed names of properties in the, in the graph definition API. Uh, but at a high level, what's going on is when you have multiple requests in a stacked chart, or actually in any time series chart, those requests are drawn such that uh, you, you draw the first one and then you draw the next one such that it could obscure the contents of the first one and then the next one after that on top of the other ones and so on and so forth. So uh, you're stacking those requests in the Z axis, if you will. Each request corresponds to one kind of layer and uh, subsequent layers can overdraw layers behind them. Uh, this can be confusing. For example, in the, uh, in the bottom left, you see what happens if you have roughly the same data set and you plot uh, that is two requests, one on top of the other. It might be hard to tell on the stream, but uh, there's another data set behind the green bars that is just almost entirely obscured by it. Um, but another cool thing that you can do is uh, the example in the upper left, which is the same data that you see in the lower left, uh, but just 
with one dimension negated. And so you're seeing uh, the yellow bars are the positive version, and then the uh, green bars are the negative version uh, extending below the zero on the, on the y-axis. So that's how you get stacking in Z, if you will. Uh, by contrast, if you have multiple queries in a single request, those queries for stacked charts are actually stacked up on top of each other in the y-axis. So that means that the uh, results of the first query are, uh, you add the results of the second query, and then we show that stacked uh, visually. This is really nice for visualizing uh, multiple distinct things stacked up on top of one another um, and can be a, uh, the knowing the difference between these two kinds of configuration can be a great way of creating more useful stacked graphs. Cool, thank you. And the final one is more than a tip, is, is an Easter egg that Kemper is going to show us. Yeah, we thought we'd just end with a fun one. Uh, for the service map that I mentioned earlier on it has a special Easter egg mode uh, we call star map. It's kind of a futuristic view of your services. And um, you can get into this mode if you have, if you're looking at a service map in Datadog, uh, you can hit control shift S and it'll uh, change into this mode. And it's uh, also navigable. It's not just a static image. So that's a pretty cool view. <laughs> that's fun. That's very cool. It was part, uh, that was uh, implemented as part of one of the, the internal hackathons that uh, that we do on a regular basis in the engineering team at Datadog. Um, I'm sure that people will We'll try it out uh, if they're if they're users of that dialogue and, and they will tell their colleagues tomorrow. Um, so thanks very much. Uh, that uh, we are going to go now for questions. But first, let me let me tell you that if you think working on these problems is interesting. Uh, we are hiring across the board. So if you go to dialoghq.com slash careers, uh, we are basically hiring in design, engineering, front end, back end, infrastructure, anything. So cool. Let's go uh, to questions now. Uh, we already have some questions from, from the audience. Uh, so that's great. Um, I have a couple of questions prepared, but uh, we will go, obviously, we will prioritize the, the questions from the audience. So Noam was asking, what good source of learning about visualizations in general could you recommend? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, it's a common question. There's a huge amount of resources online and books written about data visualization. Um, one common one I refer people to is a website called data2viz.com. It's data-2-viz, uh, using all words. Um, and and that, coincidentally, it's actually uh, created by, it's a passion project, by one of our engineers, uh, Jan Holtz at Datadog. Uh, it's a great website to, to kind of get a, a high level view of a variety of different visualization types and kind of decide uh, based on the data you have, which visualization would be best to visualize it. Uh, and it's a really it has really good resources, examples, uh, and even some code examples. And then on the, um, the more coding side, uh, D3 is pretty much uh, a standard for early development of visualizations, kind of like uh, using web standards like SVG and Canvas to render visualizations, at least custom visualizations. Uh, and one good resource to learn D3 and how to use it for visualization is a book uh, called um, uh, Full Stack D3 uh, Data Visualization. Uh, it's written by Amelia Wattenberger. Uh, it's a great book and has a companion website that has amazing examples that you can walk through the code and, and it's very interactive. So. Uh, that's a good resource uh, I like to refer people to as well. Cool. Thanks, Kemper. Um, any, any to add to that list, Mark? That, uh, uh, yeah, I found um, the book, The Grammar of Graphics, to be an approachable idea, uh, an approachable way of thinking about mapping data dimensions to visual dimensions and exploring the different possibilities for being able to do that. Uh, it's by Leland, I want to say Wilkinson, but I might be wrong about the last name there. Yeah, I, I think the author recently passed away, actually. It's, um, so I saw that news. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for sharing those. Um, so one of the things that we can do, I'll, I'll, I'll get those uh, afterwards. And once we publish the, the recording, we will make sure that the description of the video has links to those resources that has been shared. I'm sure uh, people will appreciate. Uh, the next question from the audience comes from an uh, anonymous person. Uh, I'm glad seeing the funnel chart um, uh, visualization for RAM. 
Uh, when do you think this would be available? Mark, uh, you yeah, so um, I think that the widget is generally available. I think it should be possible to create it if you're using the Rum product. Uh, I'm, it's a possibility that I'm wrong on that. I wasn't the one that uh, enabled the, the thing for everyone, but I think it's GA. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah, it is is limited to um, real user monitoring data at the moment. Yeah. Yes, you have to be using uh, RAM to 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 in order to use that one. Um, one question, also by anonymous, we don't know if this is the same person or the different anonymous person. Uh, Mark mentioned that pies are good for uh, so just few slices. What means few? Uh, because your example had like fifteen. And how do you ensure that people understand if they're using a particular chart, not only pie charts, but a particular chart in, in a good way? So my answer to that is that I think it depends. It's, it's a lot more of an art than a science. Um, really, a, readable, a, a good visualization is one that's readable and that gives you the information that you're looking for in a, in a you know, readable and understandable way. So the answer to how many pie slices is too many pie slices is just once you get to the point where it's like a bunch of little chunks and you can't really distinguish visually between them, that's probably too many. Um, but it, it, but again, it depends. I mean, if that's what you're looking for, then great. <laughs> uh, the, our broader philosophy on this is that we try to design our features and user experience such that it's hard to create bad graphs, but the more configuration options and the more flexibility we add, uh, the, the more ways there are to create, you know, confusing or unreadable visualizations. And so ultimately we have to, you know, we, we do trust our users to use the product in a way that works well for them. And because it's a relatively technical product, we can expect that our users can, you know, navigate a certain degree of, of uh, configuration complexity, hopefully not too much. Uh, and so we try to strike a balance that way. That's, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an art. <laughs> I also saw that uh, in some of the new uh, visualizations, uh, just, just having a, a thing um, related to this question, uh, in the flow map, um, the new flow map, I don't know if that's the correct name, flow map or flow chart. Request or, for that. Um, you recommend uh, actually on the, on the application, a limit on the number of services to, to use that one instead of the usual service map. Yeah, yeah, they're, the flow style graph really falls apart with a lot, uh, you know, like 40 to, to 100 nodes you can kind of like become very unreadable pretty quickly. So the network style graph cluster layout is much more efficient at showing that many services, but um, we offer both. So you can kind of pivot between depending on um, the graph you're looking at. Um. Question about the implementation. So Philippe is asking, how do you solve interactions on Kanban's rendering? I want for Mac, I guess. So the answer to that is that you need to reverse the mapping from data dimension to visual dimension. So, so you know, you have a some data value that maps to a certain position or a certain extent in your visualization. And when a user interacts with the visualization, you have to understand based on where they interacted, which data value was under that point, basically. Um, so you so you take the xy position of the user interaction whether that's a hover or a click or whatever and then you look up you know if you will where that would be in your data um what value that would have in your data and then you generally it's a question of finding the nearest data point to where that interaction took place uh there's a few other ways of doing it there's some clever tricks involving things like you know drawing an invisible canvas that you can then index into and looking up the data from there but at a high level, that's the idea. Uh, there's, there's, and then there's a bunch of different ways of kind of optimizing that lookup to make it fast enough that it happens interactively without the user noticing that anything's going on. Great, thanks. Uh, we don't have more questions from the audience, but we have a few minutes left. Uh, so I'm going to ask one of the questions that I had um, as well, um, in case we leave enough time for people to add a last minute question. Um, this one would be for, for Kemper. Uh, in the design section, you were you were talking about prototyping and prototyping uh, with different to try different colors. Uh, does that prototyping include any type of testing for color blindness? Yes, we do. We definitely do test for color blindness. 
Um, a lot of uh, palettes, there's we try to uh, have um, give meaning towards the default color palettes, but oftentimes like the green and red, for example, aren't great for uh, our color blindness. So we test out other palettes and we actually like uh, overlay them with filters and and run them past very uh, a large uh, you know internal uh, usage to see like if they're performing well. So we do a lot of testing for color blindness and we we judiciously pick um, palettes that that work well and, and, and offer options for, because everybody has different kind of vision. So we want to offer a variety of options that people can pick from. Cool, thanks. Uh, and, and Mark, uh, uh, I've seen that uh, these, usually these, these graphs they include a lot of, lot of data, different data points. So I guess performance uh, is, is something that uh, your team needs to really pay attention to. What are some of the tricks that uh, your team uses for better render performance? Sure. So yeah, uh, the way that Datadog works, it's a very data intensive product. There's a lot of, uh, there's a really large number of uh, data, individual data values being streamed into our backend all the time. And so as a consequence, it's relatively straightforward for a lot of our users to create, you know, graphs that have a thousand or several thousand or even tens of thousands of, of individual entities on them. Um, and so when you're drawing all that stuff, you have to be pretty smart about how you're doing it and you have to be quite careful to avoid doing unperformant things which can really drag down the browser. Um, this is a hard problem and there are a lot of different approaches to it, uh, but um, the high level philosophy of it is that you have to either you know, do less work or be more, do less computation or be more clever about when you do that computation. So doing less computation means things like um, implementing windowing or so-called virtualized rendering. This is where if you have a visualization that where it's possible to see only a subset of the data at one time, you make sure that you're not trying to draw all the stuff that's outside of what the user can actually see and interact with. Uh, an example of this is like the top list is a list of these bars and you can scroll the list if it's really long. If somebody's rendering an enormous top list with a huge number of bars, we actually only draw DOM for the stuff that's in the window and all of the stuff that's outside the window, we don't even try to draw it, right? Um, that's a pretty straightforward optimization conceptually, but it can be tricky to implement in practice depending on the visualization. Another good example where we do windowing actually is the uh, the service map slash topology map uh, component. Uh, what we do for the service map is if you're zoomed in and you have a bunch of stuff that's kind of outside of the window, we don't even draw that. And the implementation of that is a little bit more complex than with the top list where you only have one dimension. So uh, windowing or, or virtualized rendering is a good trick. Another one is to, we do use Canvas for a lot. And what we find is that the browser canvas is takes a little bit more time to actually draw pixels onto the screen, but then the result is that you get something that's effectively just an image. It's just like a you know PNG, and uh, the browser itself can composite and paint that into the rest of the window really easily. Whereas if you draw a bunch of SVG objects into the scene, um, the browser is going to have to render each of those things out into pixels at a variety of different times. Certain things like CSS reflows and stuff get a lot more expensive. The more DOM objects you have, and that includes SVG. And so if you're drawing a bunch of stuff into the window at the same time, like with a big canvas chart, a big time series chart, or a scatter plot, or something like that, then canvas is generally going to be more performant overall. Um, we also sometimes do stuff with WebGL, which is a very performant rendering technology. The problem is WebGL is a little bit more finicky as in terms of a, it's, it's less reliable as a drawing target, basically. Uh, and the reason for that is because GPUs are pretty complex. You can have some weird noisy neighbor problems that happen where like, uh, literally I've seen like if you're running something that's very GPU intensive in another browser tab, it can cause WebGL context in your, in the Datadog browser tab to crash. So Google Maps is a great example. I've seen cases where you have like a WebGL context in Datadog and then you open up Google Maps and turn on the satellite view and you're zooming and panning around a lot and it'll actually crash the visualization in Datadog, which is kind of weird. Um, or there's also some challenges with managing WebGL context, which is a little too technical to get into. But, but ba basically, that's why we use it in some limited cases, but not everywhere, uh, even though it would kind of solve the performance problem. Cool. Thanks very much. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks for the questions. That was, uh, that was great to see. Um, again, thanks, Kemper and Mark, uh, for participating. 
I, as I said, I, I always learn a lot uh, preparing this. So thanks, thanks a lot uh, for everybody else. Um, the video will will be published uh, soon, soonish. Um, we don't know exactly about a week. We can say. Uh, but uh, yeah, and the, those will be publicly available to share. Uh, so thanks again for, for uh, attending this one and we will see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.